And right now, without further ado, I hope that uh, Michael has had a break already. <laughs> Michael is uh, Michael is working double shifts. After his <laughs> after his speech, now he is the moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, as we introduce our panelists, please help to welcome them on stage. Familiar face, of course. Michael just finished his presentation. Mr. Michael Poon is the Executive Director, Singapore Shipping Association. Let's give Michael another round of applause to welcome him. And allow me to introduce the panel that will be joining Mr. Poon on stage. We have Mr. Francesco Gagiulo, Chief Executive Officer, International Maritime Employers Council. Let's welcome Francesco. Welcome. Next, we have Mr. Espen Polson, Chairman, International Chamber of Shipping. Let's welcome Espen, please. And joining them is Ms. Mary Liu, General Secretary, Singapore Maritime Officers Union. Let's welcome Mary. And last but not least, we have Mr. Stephen Cotton, General Secretary, International Transport Workers Federation. Let's welcome Stephen, please. Dear moderators and panelists, you may remove your masks as you are socially distanced. Stephen, you may remove your mask as we are socially distanced. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give our panel a round of applause, please, to welcome them. Thank you. Well, okay, I guess everyone is all mic'd up. I hope so. Yep. Not, not me. Uh, okay. Yeah. I will use the conventional way then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, as well, and sound check, okay? Yes, I, I believe so. Yeah. Of course, uh, Francesco, you too. Yep. Okay, great. So um, this panel is about promoting seafaring as a viable and attractive uh, career. As the MC has uh, uh, briefly introduced uh, the guests on our panel, uh, we are served with uh, probably a high-powered panel, and I feel kind of small among this uh, uh, combined uh, experiences of, uh, of the captains in the industry itself. But let me just go ahead and maybe fire up the first question that I wanted to maybe uh, kick off the panel with. You know, you know that COVID-19 has placed, you know, shipping sector and uh, seafarers in the limelight itself. Many people are definitely aware of the importance of the shipping industry on a global economy, for sure. You know, however, at the same time, it also highlighted the various risks that a seafaring a person or a career could pose, especially in the event of a pandemic. And I just talked about that in my presentation earlier on. Now, we've seen reports of seafarers stranded at sea. And they were denied crew change and support in view of the closed borders as well as, as uh, health safety regulations and so on. Now, as the world is now slowly readjusting to the new normal, the question I'm gonna ask all of you is, uh, you know, how then could we rebuild seafaring's reputation as a viable and attractive career? Um, and perhaps, uh, um, uh, Steve, uh, from ITF, uh, and also maybe Francesco after Steve uh, goes on. You, you could share some insights from being in the center of the action in the pressing issues that was faced uh, by seafarers during the pandemic. Steve. Thanks, Michael. Um, good morning, everyone. I think just to kind of recap a little bit on what Michael said earlier in his presentation, and also what the minister mentioned about maritime as a hub in Singapore, I think the major point that I took away from, from the crisis is the importance of cooperation and collaboration. And uh, Michael, very, some, from very dramatic words in your, in your presentation, but the reality was there's many people in this room who I would now call friends, but we didn't know before. And um, when we're talking to the cadets and how do we address the reality of um, why maritime is so unique, it's because our ability to respond to adversity. The reality that transportation does deliver for the world. And even though we had the pandemic and all the challenges, we continue to have conversations, we continue to solve problems. And uh, the leadership of Singapore in that process, which I think is part of why we're here, um, and the MPA and Caroline and the work they've done together with our our friends, Mary and Cam, 
from the seafarers' unions here, we're able to do our part for the seafarers. Um, that now leaves us with this big dilemma because we made the front, we made the news, we made all the main channels, we, we had 400,000 seafarers abandoned and stranded, and still some can't get off the ships now. Very big country nearby, doesn't let too many seafarers off. So we, the, the, the war isn't over, but the reality for us, um, and I think this is a kind of an ideological question for all of us, particularly the HR experts in the room, shipping, certainly in my 30 years in the ITF, has always been about reducing cost. Perhaps now's the opportunity to look at it the other way around. How do we secure the, the men and frankly, lots more women um, into our maritime profession and look at how we build the competencies and how we build the opportunities? And it will be, again, I believe, relying on the cooperation. You know, we all have different day jobs to look after, look after our members, make policy, make profit. But the reality is we have a common interest. In order to be fit for the challenges, both we've seen through COVID, but also climate, changing temperature, which makes shipping still a challenging industry, we have to find ways of making seafaring more attractive. And that means we'll have to look at how we educate, what the levels of competency are. And that's why I want to congratulate the Singaporean uh, Transport Minister on the initiatives to bring Singaporeans back to the industry. And again, without sounding too soft on Singapore, there is a government here that believes in the shipping industry. And as many of my colleagues from the international unions here, we don't get that level of support all around the world. So we have to make these initiatives work. We have to make them work in collaboration, but it's really the young, the young men and hopefully some more young women at the end of the room who we want to see in 10 years time or 15 years time, sitting up here, sitting out there, making leadership decisions. So for me, the big challenge is how do we make this amazing industry attractive to young men and women from all over the world, whichever, culture they're from want to be part of this amazing industry. So Steve, that's, that's uh, you know, I, I like the way you, you kind of like slowly ended nicely and, and, and leading on to the next few questions. It's, it's really about how do we keep this industry very attractive? But I want to hear from Francesco from a international maritime employer's viewpoint. You know, Steve earlier talked about, and it's, I'm just trying to sensationalize this, he said <laughs> that, you know, shipping is about minimizing cost. And we're looking at now a generation of seafarers who says, well, I want to be in this business, but I think, you know, give me something. Uh, and, and we know that operating a ship is expensive. So from an international maritime employer's viewpoint, what, what, what is your take on this, Francesco? Well, good, after, good, good morning, everyone. And lovely to be here. Thank you for having me, first and foremost. Um, it, it's, um, you know, following into Steve's footsteps is a bit of a, a hard act to follow because obviously he uh, is quite adept at this sort of uh, events. So um, from my perspective, or really from the perspective of the, of the employers, of the maritime employers in the, in the industry, um, we possibly have been guilty of focusing too much on the negatives, on the bad news that sometimes uh, gets, gets the headlines. Well said. But the reality is, we live in a, uh, we work in a in an industry that actually has very many positives, and I think that's one of the things that perhaps we should be focusing on a little bit more. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on seafarers stuck on board. Right. There's been a lot of emphasis on countries closing their borders, focusing on their citizens, worrying about the local community versus uh, the faith of the seafarers on board those ships. But at the same time, there's been a lot of emphasis on how important the role of the seafarer is for every, every community, for globalization in general. Yeah. And I think that's a great positive that came from the pandemic. So yes, there's been a great positive of social partners working together, working together with countries and, and governments. And that's, yes, absolutely a great, a great positive. But for me, the biggest positive is the fact that the, the unknown, the great unknown seafarer has actually caught the limelight. And if you ask me, there isn't such a thing as bad publicity. I think a lot of young uh, 
young men and women, and I agree with Steve, we need to focus a lot more on young women as well, have actually finally noticed the position. You know, during the pandemic, a lot of people were focusing on nurses and doctors, and all of a sudden, seafarers That's came, came to the fore, yeah. and they became key workers. They became something to aspire to. So I would say, let's not focus on what the pandemic did to make the position less appealing, but let's maybe think about what the pandemic did to actually create visibility for a position that is well-paid, tax-free, fully funded when it comes to training. There's, there's so many pluses that I think we could be focusing on as opposed to, oh yeah, they were stuck on ships. Let's not forget that, all right, um, I'm thinking now about the British example because that's where we operate, um, that's where our base is. Although we're obviously an international organization with members everywhere, including 26 members here in Singapore, um, in the UK, a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people lost their viability, their business. Yes. And in shipping, that didn't happen. Okay, granted, some people were stuck on board and absolutely that was sad. And we obviously joined together. We pulled together to actually make their repatriation a reality. But at the same time, that's a job that's more sought after now than it was before the pandemic. Right. Better paid now than it was before the pandemic. Right. There's been a reconnect between employers and employees. And the good employers in particular have put a lot of money and resource. So uh, I have to counter the uh, uh, limited expenses because that's not what happened during the pandemic. The good employers actually stuck their neck out and made sure that their seafarers were looked after. I that's think right. that's, that's a big plus for us. That's right. Francesco, I think you... Um I'm looking across when you're speaking, I'm looking across at the cadets that are there. I think they are all fired up right now. You know, you talk about the fact that, you know, the pandemic while had its negative parts. And, and there, there, there were also opportunities for us to shine that light of, of how critical a workforce that the globe had to depend on. Isn't it true? You know, Sister Mary, you know, we, we, we had talked about this before in the last two years. Maybe you can share with us, uh, perhaps, you know, what Singapore had done to, to highlight and make sure that seafarers was not left behind and was treated as with the respect that they had, with the critical work that they do to keep our economies running. Thank you, Michael. A very good morning to all. Uh, I think this is really absolutely a very important question. And it's something that um, we have struggled along the way to come to where we are today. And uh, there are actually, I must say, image deficit for our seafarers <laughs> and also for our industry as a whole. I think there's a lot of things that we can definitely do. And uh, Francesco, you are right. You know, um, I think at this point of time, the pandemic, you know, we turned that crisis into opportunity and we make everybody sit up and wake up to say, that, look, seafarers are key essential workers. Mm. And uh, you'll be very surprised that, you know, when I come in dialogue with different ones, uh, outside of this maritime industry, a lot of people still do not know what seafarers does. And I think in that sense, we need to, you know, bring up the image together as an industry. Yeah. And of course, over the years, and I'm glad that the MPA has also listened to the industry players, the feedback that we have, and there are strong funding elements that come into it as well. Yeah. to bring up our seafarers and uh, I'm really, really grateful and uh, thankful to our companies here for your support, especially during the pandemic time. But please don't string back your budget, but continue from there as well. I think it is important for us to have that investment training and uh, in fact, just now, I think uh, our Minister of, uh, Senior Minister of States has also shared with us about the different initiatives that come in. I think we have the Maritime Cluster Fund, we have the, uh, you know, the Trapatite the Maritime Scholarships, we have the One Maritime Scholarship, we have got the different funding that comes in for our seafarers. It, it, it is a good industry, it is a good sector, it is a good career proposition. And I think that we should continue to bring uh, work together with the Tripartite Partners and bring up the image. Sister Mary, you, you, you raised two points that I, I just wrote down here right now. You know, you're talking about bringing up the image of seafarers. And, and, I, and I think amongst the, 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 the panel here, I think Asbun is a great example of the image of a seafarer who also moved to shore. But we'll come to Asbun in a short while. But I want to talk about the other one. You, you mentioned about the fact that, 
you know, let's make sure the employers don't shrink the budget. You know, we've got to make sure that we've got to put the right investments in place. Now, which leads me to the second question here. You know, seafarers require extensive training before they can get to work on board, which could be deemed as a high opportunity cost for young, aspiring people who are considering a career in seafaring. This is not just only an issue in Singapore, but a challenge across the entire globe. Uh, just to maybe take a local example, a local example of, uh, of the number of years that a young person will come to face. Coming up from a local perspective, from the Singapore Polytechnic, they come up with uh, COC grade five, you can call it that. Uh, and then it will take an approximate five years, five years, for them to uh, achieve or even qualify for a COC1 if they pass that. Um, uh, and, um, and within that, uh, there is this opportunity cost that is, that is kind of lost. Now, there are already many, many options that young people can pursue, which would deliver faster and maybe a, a better rewards. Then how then could we attract the young to consider a career in seafaring, given the lengthy training process that we have. You know, Sister Mary, you are constantly in touch with the, uh, the young cadets in the trainings, and, and maybe you can share your view on the perceived opportunity costs for these young people. Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, it is always a delight, uh, a pleasure, a joy, to have that conversation with our young seafarers, with our cadets. And in SMOU, actually, we have uh, worked very closely with our training partners. Of course, it's our setup, the Briefing Maritime Institute. We have raised up, and in fact, we have in recruited, you know, from the public and trained them as cadets and raised them to officers. We have trained over 400 plus, and then today we have got about 100 officers. And I think that's great. And the journey that we have together with them, we hear them out. And there are opportunity costs. For example, many of them aspire to become a sea captain, a chief engineer, yep. but it takes them more than seven years, eight years, and some even above. Yep. And really away from their loved ones, away from their families, the sacrifice that they made, especially during the pandemic. I think that is really quite a journey for them. And I was just thinking, you know, we have, we have been talking about it in the industry as well. Is there any way that we can tap on technology, tap on digitalization simulator to help them to speed up the training process? That is one, one of the way. And also the other opportunity cost that they have as well, when they are back from sea, uh, while waiting for the next assignment, many of them actually uh, wait uh, longer than they thought and they have to look for alternative, perhaps in the gig economy, so that they can keep their family going, so that they can support their families as well. You know, some go into grabs, you know, and some goes into food delivery oh, and all that as well. Yes. And these are really, really opportunity costs. And perhaps the industry can come together, the tripartite partners can come together to do something about it. And Michael, I really like what our Japanese friend did, the NYK, yep. because we learned from them. I think it is a good, best business practice as well. What they did was that they shortlist their Japanese, actually, their Japanese cadets, right? NYK, I learned from Ohai, Ohai, Ohai uh, sorry, I can't get his name quite right now. Uh, never mind. Uh, he came recently to Singapore and he shared with us that in NYK, Japan, they recruited 12, 12 deck cadets, 12 engine cadets wow. deliberately and make them go through that program until to where they are. That means they rotate, huh? you sail at sea and then after that you come back ashore, then you work ashore with the company, and then you gain the experience. And from there, you move up the ladder. And really, all of us here in Singapore, we have met the former, you know, the former guys, right? The former top CEO. Yes. We have got Manji-san, we have got Nakaya, and we have got, uh, I can go on and on the list. I think all of us know them. And what is common among them is that they are all seafarers. They are all seafarers, and they made it, Aspen, Francesco, I'm sure many of you in the room here as well. Yep. How did you do it? But let's continue to impart that to our young seafarers to tell them, say, hey, you can progress. 
from sea to shore. And there's a career path for you. But we need to work that together with, along with our industry partners so that uh, hopefully we can offer them that alternative as well. Indeed, I think indeed that you can move from sea to shore. And I, I, and I think, um, yeah, um, Asbun, it's time for you to come into the picture. Any words of wisdom you can share based on the book that you wrote in your shipping life? Because you did document your ship to shore journey and, and maybe you know, draw from your experience, offer some advice to the seafarers out there or potential seafarers who are listening in right now. Asbun, please. Thank you, Michael, and good morning, everybody. Um, it, it's true, I was at sea in 1966 uh, as a 17 year old. <laughs> but we it's probably don't, we don't really want to dwell too much on that because that's, that's historical. But I can say briefly that uh, on a 9,000 dead weight uh, vessel, we had a crew of 45. Um, in 2019, I joined a 150,000 GRT container ship from here to Hong Kong uh, with a crew of uh, 20, 19 actually. So it, it sort of puts it a little bit in perspective in, in this regard. And, and this trend of, of crews becoming smaller, I, I think, will, will, will inevitably continue as technology uh, comes in. Yep. But I think at the same time, it, it, it's, I would urge any company taking on, a, uh, any ship owning company taking on young talent to have the, those persons go to sea for a limited period. Because I, I have to say, the impression it made on me on that time has stayed with me uh, forever. And, and I, I think I have a, probably a better understanding of what life at sea is like um, than someone who has not yeah. done this. And um, it may be only for a few months, but it's, it's definitely very well worthwhile. I think also it is important to underline, as Mary has already pointed out, uh, but I'll add to it, is that people who have been captains or senior officers go on, in many cases, to glittering careers. And the best one I think I can think of is Captain Gianluca um, Aponte, who left the sea in 1969 and in 1970 started MSC, Mediterranean Shipping Company, which today, 52, 53 years later, is the world's largest container company. So he started as a captain, and I, I think this is one of many examples of people who have made that, that transition. And that transition is, transition is extremely important, and I think that our seafarers need to know, and there's already been a lot of talk about this, they need to know that there is a transition to shore-based jobs, and that the skill sets that they have can be adapted or applied to jobs ashore. You know, Asbun, you, 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 know, you mentioned about the, the, the inedible transition from sea to shore. So it, it, it matches right now with a question that came in from the pigeonhole. It says here, um, let me try to find a way to put this out here. Uh, to ensure, to ensure ship, seafaring is a viable career, how can seafarers be better supported in terms of managing their careers? especially in a general inevitable switch to shore-based roles. Now, I'm not going to ask you that question. I'm going to ask actually Francesco because I think, Francesco, you, you did mention that I think seafar seafaring and maritime has an edge over the other sectors. Yeah? Uh, and perhaps you can maybe help us elaborate you know, from an international maritime employer's viewpoint. You know, how this edge uh, uh, and how in your experiences with your members, how many shipping companies have been willing to provide financial support for their officers' training, even extending beyond financial support uh, for these seafarers to be a happy crew on board the vessel itself. Francesco. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And um, of course, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, those sort of organizations that are the good employers. And there's lots of them. And we tend to try and represent uh, the majority of them within IMEC. So that's, that's the perspective I'm trying to bring here because I'm sure there'll be rogue players like there is in every other industry. Mm. However, when I talk about IMEC members and I talk about what they do, uh, you've, you've got to point out, you have to point out to the youth of today that, uh, that, that there is a, a, a massive advantage in actually pursuing a seafaring career. Uh, and that is that, I mean, I, I have a 17-year-old son. My 17-year-old son is now looking at where he's going to go to university. And uh, his dad, he's looking at how he's going to pay for university. And that's, um, yeah, it, it, it's not an easy question to answer there. The reality is, 
if you pursue a career in shipping, 99.9% .9 of employers will pay for your, or all your education. You will come out without student loan, which is the case for everyone else that goes to university these days. You come out with a degree-like piece of paper, a career that pays above average wages, a career that has the, pos the potential to turn into a lifelong career. And I, I just, last, uh, last week I visited our, our cadet uh, campus. We, we run a cadet program for the benefit of our members in the Philippines, in conjunction with one of the unions that's uh, affiliated to the ITF. Uh, and so we had 700 of our cadets there. And in my speech to the cadets, I made the point. We don't want you to just become third officer, fourth engineer. We want you to be masters. We want you to be superintendents. You're the future of this industry. Mm. And all this comes on the back of the industry paying for it, because that's the beauty of the cooperation between ourselves and the ITF, that we focus on making sure the industry is sustainable. Yeah. And I think that's something that not many other industries can say. That's true. That's true. If you want a career in IT, you're going to have to get your degree paid for. And you, I mean, the UK, I'm using the UK example because obviously that's what I'm familiar with. Um, but you come out of college with 40 years worth of repayments for your student loan. That's not the case for seafarers. Without even going into wages are above average wages of most countries, um, they're tax free. Did I mention the tax free? I mean, I <laughs> you did. Been. You did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're talking about an industry that, yes, was a bit unknown, is becoming more and more known, and the 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 pandemic helped with that. The ever given certainly helped with that because all of a sudden people realised how important shipping is when your shelves are empty because the ship is stuck in the Suez Canal. Um, it's just about us selling our industry better. Mm. I think that's the secret. That's where we should be focusing on. That's where we are focusing on. Francesco, thank you. I mean, you, you mentioned about, you know, there are many things that are unknown, but, but we, do, we may not know what we don't know, but we do know one thing. We, we do know that the maritime sector is undergoing digitalization. You know, where we tap on benefits offered by automation, smart sensors, and even enhanced communications. You know, perhaps we would come to a point in time where direct communications from onshore to offshore could be very viable when, rather than training new seafarer members, and instead of and imagining, instead of having a ship captain operating a fleet of vessels uh, at the vessel itself, but at the comfort of their homes. Um, and this leads to this question that I have on the screen here, which is about, then how do you now begin to look at and open up and offer seafaring and attract women, women in the industry itself. Because the question here talks about how would one attract women to seafaring career when sexism and hostile work and environment conditions for women remains a challenge. And I, and I would like to perhaps interpret hostile environment as very difficult and, and very hard to, to maneuver in, in, a, in a limited space and everything else. But I think with the onset of digitalization and with the way the world is moving towards to how we're working smarter, I think it opens the door. It opens the door to look at really have an equity in terms of gender and to bring women into the workforce. Um, Steve, you're looking at me and you're thinking this true, but I'm going to right now ask you what's on your mind. Well, thank you. Um, so we the statistics for, for the industry, the shipping industry, it's 1.3% of the shipboard crew are women. Now, we sit here in, in a very enlightened conversation with a government and an industry backing transition, mm. which means we've got a lot of work to do because it's, it's the, the culture, and I mean the transport culture, that needs to change and, you know, we're privileged to have Mary Lou in the ITF as our vice president for the world, but we don't have enough women in our leadership, which means when it comes to finding solutions, it's a male dominated environment. And let's be quite clear, men and women think differently. So we're, we're denying ourselves a rich talent that we need to find and we need to challenge intellectually. And I think just to come, because Francesco knows I will, my point wasn't about cost of operating cost. 
it's culture. So if we say we want the best maritime professionals, yet we give you a fixed term contract, that doesn't smack long of longevity and long term investment. If you want today's cadets to be tomorrow's chief operating officers, we've got to build in a different dynamic about how we do it. And then we've got to recognise that maritime isn't the only part of the world that's competing for talent. And the reality, and when I was talking about cost, it was more like historically traditional maritime nations used their own folks to operate their ships. Mm -hmm. And we, are, we now operate on a global level. And we saw, Michael, from the presentation, why we had to open up crew resources all around the world to meet the pandemic. But we're still a little bit stuck in that they're a short-term problem. Now, the reality for all of us is the global supply chain is being regulated in a new way, and it will become more prevalent for the clients of transport on what's their carbon footprint, what's their human rights assessment, and all these things we think, and again, I should mention, I forgot to mention Guy, uh, ICS, and of course, the other colleagues from IMEC, we didn't go into the pandemic and go, this is a union problem, this is an employer problem. We went, this is our problem. And as a group of individuals, we, took, we went together and we solved problem by problem until we began to get solutions. And I think for all the policymakers and the, the corporations, never before have we seen the industry go into the International Maritime Organization and frankly demanding quicker action working with the International Labour Organization, which is the only tripartite body in the UN system, and asking them to help us move seafarers from one place to another. So I think for me, this career opportunity, the future of the industry, we need to set the bar quite high. We need to create a new model of education. If we talk to the young people in here, and you know, I didn't bring my mobile phone, so I'm feeling slightly nervous what I'm not listening to, the reality for today's young people is access to tele telecommunications, their expectations are quite different to the masters, without picking on Esben, when he went to sea, <laughs> his expectations would have been quite different. Mm. So we have to modernize our approach. It's not easy for the unions. We know we don't like change and we worry about, will change be good and will there be as many jobs? But in the ITF, we're grasping the reality of understanding what technology means. Yes. We're grasping with what do we have to do to meet the carbon challenge? Correct. And what are those new skills? Now here today, we heard money on the table to invest in the infrastructure. Again, there's a leadership. And that leadership, the ITF is committed, because sometimes we get a little bit criticized for being so positive about our friends in Singapore, and I want to put on record their thanks in trying to lead. That STAR initiative, those three powerful women which you identified, is global leading standards. It's not happening in London. It's not happening in Dubai. It happened here. Now, we are, and this is the bit where I think it's most critical for the future, we are in an amazing industry that respects international talent. Now, we have to promote that in a new way, and we have to make our education, our safety standards, without compromising, fit for 2050 and that means we have to think in a different way and we have to invest long term and new ways of doing the job steve thank you I, you know there, there are there, there are two questions right now in a pigeon hole that i, I thought maybe it's it's kind of nice to uh to pose this to the panel um but let me go and try to collapse these two questions uh into probably one uh and uh let me just read out so that the audience uh, can follow um here it says here, seafaring are no longer attractive, especially in monetary rewards, as many shore-based careers are quite rewarding. Plus, seafaring lacks work-life balance and family time. Are we addressing it? So that's one of the questions. Uh, I think similar to that is another one that's coming up here. It says here, now to promote seafaring, there is a need to provide an understanding of the near future seafaring job scope with digitalization that you talked about autonomous technology, and how is this being campaigned to, to us nationally? So I think these two can be combined because I think it, it, talks, it really talks about the fact that if we embrace digitalization tools, perhaps that level, uh, certain parts of family time 
and work-life balance can be bridged and, and, and addressed. But I know we've got to keep it real. We have to make sure that we can bring that visualization to aspiring young people to take up a career in, 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 in seafaring. Now, and so shipping companies now, um, Francesco talked about it, it's increasingly now needing a supply of seafarers with the relevant digital skills, which you talk about, uh, Steve. Mary, you talked about that too. I think uh, in your daily uh, struggles, you're trying to figure out what's the right curriculum to put in place uh, for, for seafarers. Asben, you, you clearly mentioned, I think that's absolutely right. From the time that you were doing what you did, sailing on board the ship, to now, the modern ship has also many perks, but it's also gone very complex. So perhaps I guess this results in a skills gap between maritime talent as well as employment opportunities. Maybe one way to bridge this skills gap would be to build stronger industry and academic partnerships so that we can enable a lot more agile development of these programs and our building courses, attract these young people to come in and maybe to recalibrate back what the industry really, really needs. Yeah? Now, I've set the stage on this. Now, back to the question. So how else may we effectively identify and bring this talent into the seafaring industry itself? Now, um, now since this is focusing on perhaps uh, the future of curriculum and training, maybe, you know, Sister Mary, you could, you could share on SMOU's work and plans to stay agile in an updated era of digitalization. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think there's a very, very important question. I think Steve touched quite a fair bit on it uh, earlier on as well. I think moving forward, we definitely um, need to know that million dollar questions. What is the future of shipping? And uh, the thing about wh what SMOU is doing currently and where we are coming from, um, along in conjunction with the Singapore Maritime Week, we organized an event yesterday. And the event is really about a seminar on charting the future you know, of the Singapore Maritime you know, manpower you know, uh, transformation. I think that is really very important. And we actually bring in our industry as well. Uh, I think yesterday was about over 40 companies actually participated in that. And we want to know from you, basically, what are your needs? And not only that, not only that, we want to chart the future together. And that's where we tap on our companies encouraging them to sign on the CTC, the Company Training Committee, which just now Senior Minister of States has also elaborated quite a fair bit. Because this is the interaction session whereby we want to be part of your business strategy as well. We want to know your business plan so that we can also map the uh, future of our manpower uh, transformation map. And uh, with this um, operation and transformation uh, roadmap, we can do it together. So this is where we constantly want to engage the ground, want to hear from the shipping company. We wanted to also value add to the shipping community. So Michael, I think it is important for us to have the engagement with our industry, with our companies, and so that we can collaborate as tripartite partners and that unions can then come in to value add and to co-create the future. You know, Sister Mary, so, it's, uh, it's, so I'm, I want to come back to this again because I know that uh, it is probably something on the future generation's minds. You know, you talk about making sure that we can have enough investments and plans, making it trading a lot more easier. We've got a question actually on the screen that talks about why not, why not, why don't we look at virtual, virtual training, and embrace virtual reality training and gamification to make training more fun, more engaging and also thereby attracting even more people into, into, the, into this, uh, uh, ex, uh, this sector itself uh, and, and allow the importance of passing on experience. I think that's key. Um, but I, I think in addition to that, to ensure that shipping or rather seafaring is going to be an attractive career, there must be opportunities for seafarers to develop the career. And I talk about being real. How do we help? seafarers or potential seafarers to visualize this. Currently today, and I spoke about it earlier on, um, seafarers are generally required to acquire several certificates, several, associated with their jobs apart from the main certificate of com uh, competencies. 
The renewing of such certificates and training costs are borne by seafarers themselves. And how can the maritime sector work on providing opportunities and institutional support uh, for the seafarers to develop the skills and qualifications during their employment? So, Francesco. You saw my hand. <laughs> I, did, um, I did. Yeah, I disagree. Um, I, again, I need to reiterate, I'm here representing what I would say is the cream of mm. the industry. And that statement is not true when it comes to the cream of the industry. Our members consistently pay for upgrading training, for qualification training, and so on and so forth. But I wanted to take a step back uh, because I thought Mary uh, made, a, made a very good point about how do we make sure we are ready for what's coming, for what is already here in some cases. Yeah. And that is, A, the new generation of students if you want to call them that way. Yep. At the same time, the new generation of ships and the technology that's involved in those ships. And I think this is where we need to come together with not only the unions, i.e. the employees, representatives. And that's something, I mean, I'm not talking about a school here, but that's one of the reasons we came to Singapore this week. We, on Wednesday, had a meeting, union employers, in which we basically are talking about working together towards uh, identifying trends, identifying what's needed by the industry and by the cadets coming through, the yes. trainees coming through, yeah. uh, for this future industry, which is already here in some cases. The ultra-modern ships are already here, right. and there's going to be more and more of that. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to add is that there is another element that needs to be included in these sort of conversations, and that is academia. Because at the end of the day, we can make all of the decisions we want at the employer-employee level, but ultimately the people that need to deliver this extra level of training, this different approach to training, this different approach to education is academia. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we work so closely with the College of Manila, but we work very closely with uh, a number of other institutions in the area. I mean, uh, we have a, a very close relationship with Solon University in Southampton, which is really people will probably know it as Warsash Maritime Academy, yep. as a name in the industry. We work with them on A, delivering train-to-trainer training for educators around the world. And I, I sit on their advisor, advisory board. Their advisory board is all about what does the business need from us? Yeah. And those are the sort of conversations we have all the time. It's about digitalization, it's about the new skills required by the new workforce on the new vessels, and also how do we make that appealing to the new generation who is used to having an iPad and doing everything digitally? I mean, we, we, we sponsored a number of gamif gamification training initiatives, for example, because that's what the new generation wants. That's how they learn. They don't learn the way we used to learn. And I've got to put myself into that, into that bracket. Uh, my, my kids, I, I have three boys, and they don't learn the way I used to learn. Um, their life is, is over when their, their iPad is not working. Uh, it, it, those are the sort of things that we need to keep at the forefront of our mind when we talk about future training strategies. So yeah. academia, what do the students want? We, I think we have a good enough uh, attractive business out there. What we now need is to build the tools for it to be what it needs to be, i.e. for it to reach its full potential. And I think that's, that's where the focus should be. That's where the focus is. And it's why we had that meeting on Wednesday, Steve. Yeah. You, you, you know, Francesco, when, when you talk about, you know, for it to reach its, its full potential, many a times, you know, when, when we've seen seafarers who are about to reach their full potential and they just maybe spend a little bit more time on it and they say, well, I want to come back to shore. And, and again, it's, it's, and it's a repeating question that came out here that talks about the fact that Seafarer's career uh, should be considered as a lifetime commitment versus the current perception that it is a path towards a short side employment down the line. So how do we balance that? And, and, I, and I think it, it also comes down to this, uh, this question that I wanted to ask the panel itself, and maybe Esben can pick up on this one. You know, many of them see their role in sea as a temporary career. Uh, and they tend to want to transition to shore-based careers for either health reasons or, or after they've des achieved their desired rank and, uh, and uh, within a ship hierarchy. But sometimes it's also probably due to a need uh, for a change because, you know, seafaring job scopes 
don't vary much over time. Now, to ensure that, uh, that seafaring continues to be a very viable career, how can seafarers be better supported in terms of managing their careers, and especially in a general, in a general inevitable switch uh, to shore-based roles? You know, um, uh, Esben, you, you, you are clearly a good example of where you've spent your time. Maybe share with us, uh, you know, your journey on how you actually successfully moved on while many years on, on, on board a ship into a shore base in a very successful career that you have right now. I, I have to correct you. I wasn't at sea for, for several years. It was actually a question of months. But anyway, right. that, that's it, probably beside the point. I think, I think um, to me, what, when one thing we need to do is we need to start this whole process younger. We need to go to the schools mm. and, and plant the seeds there. Obviously. And I've, I've, I've felt this for, for a very long time. We also do need, do need to work much more closely with the universities. I think it's beginning to happen. We, it happens a bit here in Singapore and certainly in, in Scandinavia. That's, that's long established and, and has been very successful because the, the practicalities of what we do combined with the academics is, you know, is, is a good it's a good combination. But I think we should also bear in mind that the, the reality of all this is that this is a competition for talent. Exactly. Uh, you, you know, in every industry, there is a competition for talent. We have to compete. We have to sex up, uh, for want of a better word, what, what we're doing. We need these ambassadors that we talked about earlier and advocates is a great idea. We need real life young ones to go out and tell other young ones that this is about, instead of old geezers like me, uh, trying to trying to make people enthusiastic about it, we need the young ones themselves to do it, yeah. and and this so this idea of advocate and ambassador is a very very good one, and um, I I would say that's the a combination of that. I'm more than happy to mentor, but I think we need the young themselves to be, to be doing it. As as Bernie, I think you put it nicely and rightly, and we're almost running out of time. I think it, it is a competition for talent, and maybe perhaps as we're running out of time, I'm going to ask one last question and and. Hopefully, we can sum up the panel discussion today. Um, in a world where young talent have many attractive opportunities out there for them, uh, attractive alternatives beyond seafaring and everything else, what, what in quickly amongst uh, the four of you, uh, you know, help us sum up, you know, what would be your inspiring statement uh, to people who are listening in, people in this room, probably parents who, want, who may want to convince to get their, their, their kids uh, to be a part of seafarers, uh, for them to take a path and to consider a career in, in seafaring. Let's start with uh, Steve. Well, th well, thank you. I think fantastic panel. And if I look around the room, what is the best part of the maritime industry is it brings so many different cultures together to work towards a common objective. And I think just to take sort of elements, we need to make the whole profession and the education to, you know, if you speak to young people in Singapore today, just passing their graduation, they don't really know what to do. So we have to give them the skills, not just to navigate a ship or to change a sensor in the engine room, but to give them the skills in the education to run a corporation understand profit and loss. We have to build up opportunities so their skills can become transferable Fantastic. from the ship to the shore. Yeah, so curate the skills for them. Sister Mary. Uh, we all say, Steve, thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud to be associated with the maritime industry. And I must say that building Singapore Core, from what I hear in our session yesterday, it is a very, very uphill task. Very difficult because everywhere, are more attractive, perhaps the marine time is more visible as well. But the thing is that I just want to urge all of us in this room and in the sound of my voice, never, never give up. Continue to build the Singapore core. Singapore is an IMC, International Maritime Hub, and we must continue to do so. And there are good opportunities out there with your seafaring experience, seafarers, you have an ecosystem of opportunity open up before you. So never, never give up. And I just want to urge our industry players as well, walk that journey together with them. Mm. Don't leave them behind. As you evolve, as you grow, as you transform, bring them along with you and walk that journey. 
And I just want to let you know that the labor movement is together with you because we want to see our company thrive. We want to make sure that our workers benefit from there. Mm. And we hope that our companies can actually benefit our workers by paying them better wages, Francesco, better <laughs> wages, better welfare, at the same time, better work prospect as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Fighting spirit. I like that very much. Esben. I think we have to be realistic and say that we want to get people into seafaring, but we must recognize that as careers are shorter uh, as, as technology changes, this is the way the world is. Yes. But the key point to me is, please bear in mind that shipping is many, many things. It's shipbroking, it's chartering, it's agency, it's operations, it's finance, it's the law. There are so many aspects to it. And, and I myself, I've tried a number of these things during my uh, 51 years of doing this. <laughs> and, uh, and I may have a, a few left still, but, but nonetheless, the young people need to bear in mind that there are many, many aspects to this industry. And there's for sure one of them that would be of interest to any one individual, hopefully. Well said, well said. Francesco, last uh, words for you. Yeah, I mean, I'd say to summarize, it's an industry that allows you to get to a very good quality job mm. without being indebted yep. like many other industries would do. It's an industry that pays you good wages. It's an industry that has variety, as has been just pointed out. There is a number of careers you can, you can take when actually pursuing a job in this industry. And most importantly, <laughs> I mean, I look at the reasons why I joined the ship many, many, many moons ago. Uh, and that was, I got to see the world. I got to meet uh, other people from other countries. And also, of course, I came from south of Italy and uh, I, my, my, my view of the world was very limited. Singapore is a whole different proposition. You know? <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, you guys are multinational, multicultural. Right. And uh, you, you obviously already have some of that. But for me, that was a major attraction to the job, a major attraction to the industry. Mm. So I, I think that for us, it's important to make sure that we do it right in terms of the tools we use to do it. Yep. But at the same time, we don't underplay ourselves. We don't um, do us a disservice by actually focusing on the negatives in the industry, which Absolutely. like every other industry there are. Absolutely right. Yes. Uh, and actually focus on the fact that there are great opportunities in this industry. Um, and digital, digitalization is making a lot of the skills required a, a lot more applicable to other industries as well, so portable. So whilst in the past people may have felt, wrong by the way, may have felt that uh, becoming a captain gave you skills that you then don't get to use in the industry, which we know that you do, but the perception may have been that. With, with the new curriculums, uh, uh, the curricula, uh, uh, and the new approach to new systems and technologies, new ways of learning, I'd say that makes the industry even more appealing. More appealing to men and women. Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. So I think with that, we're going to end the, uh, the panel discussion. We're just slightly five minutes over time. But first of all, let me say thank you to the audience for sending in your questions. We didn't have time to answer all of them, but I hope that we were able to actually, you know, reassure you that uh, that shipping or rather seafaring is a viable and attractive career to put in place and please join me in thanking the panelists uh, for their contributions here this morning thank you to our panel and thank you mr pun for moderating as well thank you very much thank you i'd like to invite you back to your seats thank you very much you may go back to your seats thank you thank you <laughs>